Amen. Last week we talked about how the uh, common traditions of our culture point us to the real longing of our hearts, which is found in Christ. And the relationships that we long to have at Christmas really are fulfilled in relationship with God that comes through Jesus Christ. The celebration and the joy that's so great and so wonderful and then sometimes fades is found in everlasting measure in God's presence. And, and I'm clinging to that because it's all going to come to a conclusion in a few days. And it's just going to be awkward that you have an evergreen in your house. And, and all sorts of other stuff, right? Don't Christmas decorations just look ugly during the day? Come on, let's be honest. But at night, man, they just light up and it's beautiful, right? That's, that's kind of like me sometimes. Okay. Uh, let's, let's go to Luke chapter 1 uh, on page 1019 in the church Bible. This morning we're going to look at two of the great uh, sections um, about the Christmas story. I hope you are familiar with the biblical narrative of the birth of Christ. If, if you're not, I, I want to invite you to read Luke chapter 1, chapter 2. Maybe tonight it'll take you about 10 minutes, not even, and, and uh, you can see the, the whole story unfold. It's awesome. Or maybe you want to start in Matthew, but Luke uh, chapter 1 this morning, we're going to read about Jesus' mother, Mary, and his uncle, Zacharias, and how they responded with the news that they had heard, right? So an angel comes to Mary, says, hey, Mary, how's it going? Don't be afraid. Guess what? I know you're an unmarried uh, virgin teenager, but you're going to be pregnant soon because that's normal, right? We're all like, oh, yeah, that's crazy. How am I going to have this child? Oh, the Holy Spirit will be involved, and that's how it's going to happen? I mean, that's crazy, too, people. Come on, don't become familiar with this story because you know what it's, the story ends. This is wild. And, and so Mary processes all these things, and she's also told that her cousin who's older, Elizabeth, is having a baby. And, and I know that the, the virgin birth is miraculous, but having a, a woman in uh, maybe their 70s or 80s have a kid, that's pretty much miraculous, too. Come on now, right? Some of the women in the back said amen. Okay, so Elizabeth has a baby. She's going to have a baby. Her son is going to be named John. Her, her husband, Zacharias, is kind of like, come on. And so he gets his mouth shut for the duration of her term. Amen. Can I tell you that we did not plan that, but I knew somebody was going to say that, so... <laughs> So Mary, uh, hearing the news about her own life and future and also about her cousin Elizabeth, she makes her way to Elizabeth's house, and that's where we pick up in verse 39 of chapter 1 in the Gospel of Luke. Now at this time, Mary arose and went in a hurry to the hill country, to a city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cried out, with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. How has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. I mean, Mary, Mary doesn't know that Elizabeth is really pregnant. She didn't see on Facebook that they were expecting she was told this by an angel, and now she's showing up, and she gets there, and Elizabeth says, Mary, and th there's this sweet reunion, and Elizabeth says, not only does she confirm that she's pregnant, but she knows Mary is too. It's amazing, miraculous, amazing, amazing things that are happening here. And so Mary, sort of spontaneous, because of all the excitement and joy, she breaks out into praise, and she says this. Verse 46, and Mary said, my soul exalts the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my savior, for he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. And for behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me. And holy is his name and his mercy is upon generation after generation towards those who fear him for he has done mighty deeds with his arm, he has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart, and he has brought down rulers from their thrones and exalted those who are humble. 
He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. And Mary stayed with her about three months and then returned to her home. So Mary kind of processing all of this stuff that's happening in, earlier in the chapter and in her life, she breaks out in praise, declaring, God, you're amazing and you're doing the things that you said you were going to do. Mercy is coming. Salvation is coming. Peace is coming. Deliverance is coming. The, the bringing down of the corrupt, prideful rulers and an exaltation of the humble people that maybe uh, nobody knows their name. And she's just processing all this and she starts praising God. And in, in your Bible, what we just read is that she saw that God was being merciful. Merciful means that you get goodness even though you deserve punishment. He's, she says that he has done mighty deeds and scattered the proud, exalted the humble, brought down rulers from their thrones, filled the hungry, sent away the rich, empty-handed. It's sort of like a reversal of the way the world is supposed, or the way the world is working is beginning to happen, right? You know, Jesus, who's going to be the king, wasn't born in the palace. He's born in a barn. He didn't have some royally, you know, gold embossed crib. He was put in a, in the place where the animals ate. And so Mary is seeing all of this unfold and is, God, you've filled the hungry. You've sent away the rich empty handed and you've, you've given us help. This is the thing. Mary is, she's interpreting the promise of Jesus's soon arrival in this way. Now let's see what uh, happens when John is born and Elizabeth has her child. Verse 57. Now the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth and she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord had displayed his great mercy toward her. Right? She was in, beyond the age of having children and had no children, which would have been difficult in their honor and shame culture. They were rejoicing with her. And it happened that on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. They were going to call him Zacharias after his father. But his mother answered and said, no, indeed, but he shall be called what? John. And they said to her, there's no one among you, relatives who's called by that name. And they made signs to the father. Remember, he's, he's, he can't talk. It's been nine months. Oh, boy. And so they're trying to get Zacharias. Are we going to name him Zacharias Jr.? And he's trying to get their attention. He can't, he can't speak. And he asked for a tablet, not like an iPad, but like a piece of slate where he wrote the name down, Okay. His name is John, and they were astonished. And at once his mouth was open and his tongue was loose, and he began to speak in praise of God. And fear came on all those living around them, and all the matters that were being talked about in all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them kept them in mind, saying, What then will this child turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord was certainly with him. And now watch what Zacharias does. Verse 67. And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit, and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people and raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from old, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy toward our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. The oath which he swore to Abraham, our father, to grant us that we, being rescued from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and in righteousness before him all our days. Talking about Jesus and the coming of the Messiah. And now about his son, John, he says, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, with which the sunrise from on high will visit us to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. So Zechariah's prophecy, similar to Mary's song of praise, this is a spontaneous, spirit-inspired sort of interpretation of all that's going on, right? Last night, after uh, so many saints had helped my wife and I move into our home, right, on the week, the, the, the couple days before Christmas, right, and you got things to do, and you came, and you, I just, I sat there, and I, I was just amazed at how much love we were shown, and I 
I sent out some texts. Thank you. you know, and Ron said, brother, you thanked me already. And I know, I know, I had to say it again. I was just, I was just so blessed and grateful, right? And, and so that's what's sort of happening here. They're thinking about all that's transpiring, all that's happening, and they're praising God and they're magnifying him and, and exalting him. You see that? Zacharias talks about that God has visited us and accomplished redemption, raised up a horn, which is a, which is a symbol of a powerful ruler from David's house. He speaks of salvation from our enemies and those who hate us, that, that all this is happening to show mercy and that God is remembering his promises so that they could have rescue from their enemies, that they might serve and worship him without fear. That they could have a knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of sins because of God's tender mercy and that there could be something that would shine on those who sit in darkness, those that are covered by the shadow of death. There are babies being born all over the world today. Statistics tell us that there are uh, an average of 350,000 babies born every day. 350,000 babies born every day all over the world. I mean, we're small. The world is big if there's 350,000 babies being born today. There's also many babies that have been born on December 25th, right? Now, we know Jesus wasn't actually born on December 25th. That's the day that we celebrate his birth. But, but even that, even the fact that the 25th thing, right, not only are there, there are babies born, tons of them every day, but there's a lot of people that were born on December 25th, too. You know how I know? Because Wikipedia lists who they are. Like the great Alice de Lacy, the fourth countess of Lincoln. Born on December 25th in 1281. Not the third, not the fifth, but the fourth countess of Lincoln. You know who else was born on December 25th in 1642? Isaac Newton, the great scientist, philosopher, and Christian. In 1717, Pope Pius VI. I know some of you knew that. But in case you thought it was the Pope Pius V, it was the sixth. In 1878, Louis Chevrolet who was the Swiss-American race car driver and businessman who co-founded Chevrolet, was born in 1878. A few years later, in 1899, Humphrey Bogart was born. And in 1946, Jimmy Buffett was born. Now, I'm bringing this up because there's a, there's a lot of people born every day, and there are some significant people born on December 25th, right? But yet, on December 25th, a couple days from now, and, and all this month and all beyond that, we haven't been celebrating Jimmy Buffett. Some of you have. <laughs> and some of you prefer a margarita than the eggnog. You know who else was born on December 25th? Sherry Roach. Yeah. In 19... <laughs> Whatever equals 39 years from December 25th, right? And then in 1972, Mac Powell was born. Mac Powell is the lead singer of Third Day. He wrote the song, Soul on Fire. And yet, on December 25th, we don't all wake up and, God, I'm running for your heart, right? We don't sing that. That's not how we celebrate December 25th, because Mac Powell was born. Why don't we universally celebrate them? Why don't we decorate our homes with reenactments of their birth and the people who came to see them and to see these children in the hospital, right? Why, why don't I have little figurines and statues of this reenacted, right? This is when my son was born, right? A little rose statue, <laughs> right? A little Uncle Joe and, and, and Papa coming in on this, you know. The, why don't I have little figurines of this, of this birth, and of Jimmy Buffett and all the counts and blah, 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 the people I just said. The reason why is because uh, something way more significant than these things uh, occurred that we celebrate on December 25th. But what I, what I hope to, to illustrate this morning 
is that we cannot just celebrate that he was born, but really what we celebrate is why he was born. We cannot just celebrate that he was born, but we must celebrate why he was born, right? All these people were born, great. There was a day that Jesus was born when Mary had her firstborn child. But if we, if, we don't, if we don't really get it, what the scripture is telling us this morning, we will be busy celebrating that he was born and miss out why he was born. And that makes, that makes the birth of Jesus different than your birthday. Or at least it should. You know what we do on our birthdays? We make plans. We do fun things. We have people over. We go out for a meal. We decorate the house. We open presents and we clean up. And then it fades away because you and I aren't that big of a deal. We get excited when our birthday comes up. And, and we get to do that again. And then after a couple weeks, like, pl nobody in their right mind goes around saying, you know, it was my birthday three weeks ago. <laughs> I'm living in the spirit of my birthday. When was it? Yesterday? No, it was three months ago. I mean, nobody does that. I mean, there are people that do that, but those are the people we avoid and need to pray for. <laughs> but think about how we celebrate the fact that Jesus was born. Right? You heard what I just said we do for our birthdays. But for Jesus' birthday, we make plans. We do something fun. We have people over. or We go out for a meal. We decorate the house. We open presents and we clean up. And then, oftentimes, it fades away because though we don't want to admit this, we don't realize that it's a big deal. Because what we celebrate on Christmas, when it fades, is that he was born, not why. And those are two different things. That Jesus was born and why Jesus was born make all the difference in the world to whether or not we get the magnitude of what we're talking about this morning and all that we've been doing these last weeks. We cannot just celebrate that he was born. We must celebrate why he was born. And so that brings us back to our text this morning. When, when Mary hears that her son is going to be born and then he going to be the Messiah, and, and she's going to call him Jesus, she says this, mercy, God has done mighty deeds, he scattered the proud, exalted the humble, brought down the rulers, filled the hungry, sent away the rich empty-handed, given us help. That's what Mary says when she finds out why Jesus is born, not just that. Zechariah says, what does it mean why Jesus is born, why the Messiah has come, all of these things. All of these things. And so, if we examine this list of what poured forth from the heart of these two saints when they heard the news of the Messiah's birth, we can see that there's often a disconnect between how they respond and how we respond. Are you following what, where we're going so far? Okay. Those that weren't didn't even hear me because they're on Facebook. <laughs> when we look at the list of things that Mary and Zacharias rejoiced in coming to pass through the birth of Jesus, when we look at their list and, and, and sort of have a confusion as to why they would say those things. Partially it's because we don't feel that we need those things. And so the bigness of these things doesn't affect us. Have you ever gotten a gift you don't need? I've gotten them. This sweater. <laughs> Any Patriots paraphernalia that you people have ever tried to <laughs> sneak my way. Mona gave me a box of Patriots tissues, which little do you know, the ladies have been using for toilet paper in the bathroom. <laughs> Peter Taffy uh, gave me a Christmas gift a couple days ago. It was a battery-packed uh, car charger, 
right? So that you don't need another car if your car, if your battery dies, right? It's this great pack, and, and all, you can help somebody else. You can, you can jumpstart your own car. It also has two uh, outlets, right? It has a USB outlet. You could charge your phone. It says that, that it lasts for hours and hours, and you can, uh, if you're stuck in the woods and you left the lights on, you're not stranded because there isn't another vehicle. You can jumpstart your own car with this power pack. You know why he got that for me? Because a few weeks ago, he jumped my car because I left my lights on. And so you know what I did when I received that gift from him? I got it, and I was like, wow, this is a great gift. You know why? Because it was something I recognized I needed, and his thoughtfulness to give me that gift blew me away. And so we look at the reason why Jesus came, which is spelled out by these two songs of praise, and we go, that's nice. Yeah, this sweater. I mean, it's not nice, but, you know, you follow along at the analogy, like, yeah, that's nice. Thank you. That's something I can use once a year. That, I, I have other sweaters that, I can, that are more practical for me. Because this sweater was not a gift that I needed, and so when it's given to me, I don't get the magnitude. Now, if I was homeless, right, and, and it was February, I would wear this if it was freezing. Whether I, I was Jewish or a Muslim, I would wear this sweater. Because I needed the gift that was given to me, and so it really meant something to me. And so when Mary and when Zacharias say, mercy has come, salvation has come, deliverance from our enemies has come, this is it, this is it, the promise, the prophecy being fulfilled, this is what we needed, this is what we longed for, we go, okay, that's cool, that's great, and it means something to us that Jesus was born, and then January comes, and then February comes. But if we could grasp on, church, why he came, that's something that we need to cling to and that we long for and desperately need every day of our lives. Not just that he was born, but why. And these saints got it. And it's easy for us to understand why they got it. It's easy for us to understand why they long for righteous political government because they were living as, as refugee peasants in little houses made of stone and, and wood and, and sand. And the whole family lived in one room. And, and the tax collectors would come and, and extort them for their money. And, and if they couldn't pay, they would take the, the very animal that they used to make the, the money that they needed to pay the oppressive government of Rome. People would die when they had kids in this culture. There, there, there's, there's times in history where sicknesses that you and I don't even think twice about would kill them because they didn't have what they needed to, to, to care for their families and, and for themselves and for their bodies. And so we get why they longed for a new world to come because they were living a life and their everyday moment cried out, we need something better than this. Rome was very oppressive. They did not have luxury. Mary is a descendant of King David. Nobody cares about that in the, in the world in which she lives. Their land is not their own. Their houses are not their own. It all belongs to Rome, and Caesar's in charge. What he says goes. And so when the angel comes and says, I'm bringing you a deliverer that's going to bring down the, the Caesars, that's going to bring down Herod, and it's going to exalt you humble, faithful people that nobody knows your name, but you've been serving God day and night, praying, live for, living for him, staying holy, following the law of Moses. They said, yes, come quickly. Come quickly, Messiah. We, we long for you. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Ransom captive Israel. So we get why they said this, right? right? They needed deliverance from their enemies. Their enemies were walking their streets, 
pa patrolling their streets and their roads and knocking on their doors and taking their taxes with force. That's what the, they lived in. And so they longed for rescue and redemption and mercy and salvation from their enemies. And they said this. And so when you and I, bless God, American Christians living in homes with so many sweaters we can afford to wear ugly ones, where we experience freedom, where we experience joy, where we have access to pleasure, where we can eat the food that we want to without working hard to decide to, to whether or not the earth is going to reward us for the farming we put in. We've got everything we need and want at our fingertips, and, and, and it's right there, and we, we are a blessed people. We are a prosperous people, and the danger of that is that we forget that we are in desperate need of the very things that they were. And it's not as obvious because we have comfort. Regardless your view of the current political situation in this country or around the world, you and I don't fear for our lives when we walk outside. If you don't pay your taxes, you know what you can do? File an extension. You know what you can do after you file the extension? You can blow off the IRS. And they'll send you bill collection notices. They're not coming for your kids. What do we need salvation for? What do we need rescue for? What do we need righteous political government for? What do we need peace on earth for? We are, we are living in a relative uh, representation of those very things that these guys are praising God in song for. However though it appears that life is good. Everything isn't really good. I'm like this a lot. When I have my external circumstances of my life and my world seeming good, I'm tempted to forget that brokenness remains. And I'm less aware of my need for these things that these saints of old rejoiced in. And let me give you three reminders. Number one, you and I live... Though it may not be outside your door or in your home, we live in a world that is broken. The world around us is broken. The corruption and the controversy of our government right now is nothing compared to living in a place of, of authoritative dictator rule where one group gets slaughtered because their noses are shaped a different shape than the guy in power. There are 250 orphans in Rhode Island. I'm not talking about children that have been placed in foster care. I'm talking about 250 uh, children in Rhode Island that will be in group homes for Christmas. The world is broken. We have husbands that abuse their wives. We have mothers that abuse their children. We have hunger. We have, in, in, even in this country, the world we live in is broken. There were fires burning all of California a few months ago. There are typhoons and all these different things around us that blip for a little bit. It's a trending topic for a little bit. And then guess what? It's all better. You know why? Because there's a new iPhone. And I forget that the world that we live in right now, just like them, is broken. And not only is the world around us broken, you and I are broken. Oh, man, we do a good job pretending that's not the case. We'll put on our Sunday best and our Sunday smiles to show up to work. <laughs> I'm not even talking about coming here. But man, there are things in my heart and, and our hearts that are, that are not good, that are broken. I don't, I don't like what the stress of these last two weeks has brought out in me towards my family and children, if you know what I mean. Driving home from a Christmas event, my children sing Christmas carols in the back. Ah! Be quiet! <laughs> Doing the very thing we hope they do. I can't handle it. Something's wrong with me. Amen? Amen. Tell your neighbor, something's wrong with me. Amen? <laughs> and I know we live in a culture that, that doesn't validate the Scripture's view of humanity. We live in a society where, where people don't think of themselves as inherently evil but inherently good. And, and I don't care what, what, what they say or what our view is or whatever. I just know what's happening in my own soul. And you know what? 
Whether you want to admit it or not, you do too. None of us want our secret lives. None of us want our thoughts to be on the PowerPoint presentation next week. Amen? Amen. And whether or not you agree with God's standard and whether or not you and I have lived up to God's standard, we have not even lived up to our own standards. We're not the fathers and the mothers and the husbands and the wives and the children and the employees that we really want to be. We fall short of not just God's standards, but even our own standards, because you know why? Not only is the world broken, we're broken. And the reality of this is that this brokenness, both in our world and in ourselves, is ultimately going to break us. We're not going to live forever. There will be a time when every one of us, just like all those people we listed before, are going to die. And we're going to face our creator on the last day. And he is going to say, how did you do with this life that I gave to you and this world that I entrusted in your care? With all of our technological advancements and all of our achievements in philosophy and science, we're not getting better at not dying. We may last a little bit longer, but that's something that we all face. See, the brokenness in our world and the brokenness in us is ultimately going to break us. Now, great Christmas message, Pastor Victor. <laughs> Tidings of comfort and joy. I mean, the kids were so cute, and now you just spoil it. Here's the thing. The state of our world and our lives is just like it was for Mary and Zacharias 2,000 years ago. The difference is they understood it because the world around them was more obviously broken because of the situation in the world around us. And so when they heard the news that the Redeemer was coming, they realized that they needed a Savior. There was nothing inside of them that was going to fix their situation or the world around us. And the reality is there's nothing inside of us that's going to fix it either. You and I are in need of a Savior. We are in need of a Savior. We're in need of someone to rescue us from our enemies, right? You may have wonderful relationships with the people around you, but there's a devil that's out to, to steal from you, to kill you, to destroy your lives, to cause havoc in your families. And, and, and God says, I'm sending a Savior to deliver you from your enemies. Every one of the things on this list is not something that was just for them back then. It's just they got it. And so I am praying that this morning we could understand the reason for this season is not just that Jesus came. It's why he came. It's why he came. He came to do these things, which weren't things that just Mary needed. They're things that we need in our lives. And so... So when you and I hear the very familiar refrain about why Jesus came, I hope this morning we can, we can take a renewed, sober look at what it really means to have this promise made. It says in Luke 2, verse 10 and 11, the angel says to the shepherd, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a what? Savior. A Savior who is Christ the Lord. When the angels came, they said, this is what you guys have needed and longed for, the Savior from the brokenness in the world and in yourselves. And it happened that day. And they went, I can't imagine them saying much. Matthew 1, 21, the angel to Joseph regarding his wife Mary, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name what? Jesus. 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 For he shall save his people from their sins. Church, that's why Jesus came. Jesus came to save us from the sins that are breaking us. 
He came to save us from the brokenness in this world. We can join Mary and Zechariah and not just be like, oh, isn't that nice, a warm, fuzzy feeling because of Jesus? No, this is the good news of great joy for all people. That there's a way to be free from the brokenness inside of your heart. That there's a hope coming where the brokenness in this world is going to be healed and he's going to make all things new. Everything that's wrong is going to be made right. That's what we're doing right now. That's what we're celebrating right now. That's what we're singing about right now. And you know what? When the garbage goes out later in the day on December 25th and all the wrapping paper is gone and the kids have already broken the toys you bought them, we have a Savior. We have a Savior from the brokenness in our souls and in our world. And so I want to ask you this Christmas, even just for these moments, to, to, to realize and recognize in your soul that you and I need that Savior. See, the coming of, of Jesus into the world isn't that sweater we don't need. It isn't that gift that we didn't really need. It's the very thing that we've desperately needed. And God loves you and I so much that he is giving us the gift for us to be free from all this brokenness for free. It's free. He's giving us the opportunity for salvation for free because he loves us. Mm. That's tidings of comfort and joy. That's great news of great joy, which will be for all people. And what we celebrate this time of year is that she did bear the son, and she did call him Jesus, and he did save his people from their sins, and he's still saving you and I today. Will you pray with me as we close with this reflection? Oh God, I am so in need of this gift. I am so in need of what you have done for me. I am so in need of your mercy. Thank you for sending your son. Thank you for freely giving us your son. Oh God, forgive me for missing what this great time is all about. Thank you for this reminder again today. God, thank you for your love. Thank you for your kindness to us. And I pray right now that for each person sitting in this room, Lord, we could accept this gift of your son. Not as, oh, isn't this nice, but the very cure that will cure our diseases. The very rescue that will deliver us from the depths of despair that we are in. The very sacrifice that was made so that we do not have to pay for our sins. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for sending your son into the world. And Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for willingly offering yourself for us. We celebrate you today. In Jesus' name, amen.